loan of $24,154,518.85 in the form of a grant for the federal fiscal year 2020 staffing for adequate fire and emergency response, also known as SAFER grant, awarded by the Federal Emergency Management Agency to be administered by the Boston Fire Department. This grant will be uh, for training a class of 85 recruits at the Boston Fire Department Training Academy and reimbursement for their salaries uh, for 36 months. Docket 0161, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $2,500,000 in the form of a grant for fiscal year 2021 National Sex Assault Kit Initiative awarded by the United States Department of Justice to be administered by the Boston Police Department. Docket 0162, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $527,586 in the form of a grant for fiscal year 21 connected and protected, awarded by the United States Department of Justice for the administration by the Boston Police Department. This grant will fund clinicians, direct project coordinator, community partnerships for translation and outreach and staff costs, for Section 12 activities carried out by the Boston Emergency Services Team in partnership with the Boston Police Department Street Outreach Unit. Target 0163 message and order, authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $491,316 in the form of a grant for the First Responder Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act Coordinated Agreement awarded by the United States Department of Health and Human Services to be administered by the Boston Fire Department. The grant will fund a collaborative effort between the Boston Fire Department, First Responders, the Mayor's Office of Recovery Services, the Boston Public Health Commission, and community-based organizations to improve the city's response to the opioid overdoses, year four of a four-year grant. Talk at 0164, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $272,013 in the form of a grant for fiscal year 2021 DNA Capacity Enhancement and Backlog Reduction Program awarded by the United States Department of Justice to be administered by the Boston Police Department. The grant will fund two criminalist positions, overtime, lab supplies, and continuing education expenses. And Docket 0166, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $125,000 in the form of a grant for fiscal year, for federal fiscal year 2021, Violence Against Women Act Stop Grant, awarded by the United States Department of Justice, passed through the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Boston Police Department. The grant will fund a civilian violence advocate who will provide services for victims in Jamaica Plain, East Boston, Charlestown, as well as overtime for all domestic violence advocates. These dockets were sponsored by Mayor Wu and referred to the committee on January the 26th of 2022. This hearing is being held virtually according to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 that modifies certain requirements of the open meeting law and relieves public bodies of certain requirements, including the requirement that public bodies conduct its meeting in a public place that is open and physically acceptable, accessible to the public. The public may watch this meeting live on Xfinity 8, RCN 82, Verizon 964, and via live stream at www.boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. It will also be rebroadcast at a later date. The public may also provide written testimony, testimony via the video conference. If anyone listening would like to do so, you should email the committee email and or staff contact for the link and instructions of how to do so. Our staff for this hearing is Cora Montron. Cora's email is as follows. Cora, that's C-O-R-A dot Montron, M-O-N-T-R-O-N-D at boston.gov. Again, Cora, C-O-R-A dot Montrond, M-O-N-T-R-O-N-D at boston.gov. The committee's email address is C-C-C dot P-S at boston.gov. C-C-C dot P-S at boston.gov. Additionally, members of the public may submit written comments to the committee. Um, send it to Cora's email and that will be made part of the public record and made available to all members of the Boston City Council. Uh, that said, we have representatives from the Boston Police and Boston Fire Department providing testimony today uh, on behalf of the Boston Fire Department. I see Commissioner Dempsey is here, along with Deputy Commissioner for Administration and Finance, Kathleen Judge. Uh, Commish, anyone else joining you at this time? I'm no counselor. Just Very good. Yeah. Thank you. And testifying on behalf of the Boston Police Department is Jenna Savage, Deputy Director of Research and Development. Uh, Kevin Kosarek, uh, uh, if I'm pronouncing it, um, right, Director of Crime Lab. 
uh, Captain Therese Kamecki, Commander, Criminal Justice Division, Family Justice Division, and Lieutenant Richard Driscoll, Commander of the Sexual Assault Division. Jenna, anyone in addition to um, those aforementioned who will be testifying? I think that's it. Very good. Uh, before I turn it over to my colleagues for brief opening statements uh, in order of their arrival, unless there are any objections from those testifying, I definitely want to take uh, dockets 0159 and 0163 uh, together first. Uh, those are the fire department ones, so we can uh, uh, let uh, Commissioner Dempsey and Deputy Commissioner Judge um, testify, provide testimony, take any questions, and then leave so we can focus the four remaining grants uh, with um, representatives from the police department. And I just have one uh, letter of absence from one of our colleagues. I just need to read into the record uh, for um, City Council at Large, Ruth Z. Louis Jen, uh, dear committee, um, uh, public safety and criminal justice. I regret to inform you that on AML 210, the Committee on Public, ha Public Safety and Criminal Justice dockets today, 0159, 0161, 0162, 0163, 0164, 0166. Um, and I, ex I wanted to express particular support for the grant funding victim, civilian, civilian victim, uh, civilian violence advocate grant and provide that provide services for victims of domestic violence that specifically docket 0166. I also look forward to a larger conversation about how we can deal with overtime funding as some of the grants go to support aspects of overtime for individual positions that while worthwhile individually, we must think critically about overtime expenses and how it is managed. My staff will be attending and I will be thoroughly, I will thoroughly review the video, uh, hearing minutes and public testimony submitted to you or any members of the public have any questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to contact my office directly, 617-635-4376 or email at rootz.luigian at boston.gov. Sincerely, Councillor at large, Ruth Z. Luigian. So with that, um, in order of arrival, unless I'm, um, if I don't have the correct order, let me just double check here. Uh, Council President Ed Flynn is on, followed by uh, newest colleague, Councillor Brian Worrell. So uh, I'll just allow uh, my colleagues just a brief opening on these dockets and we'll get right into it. Council President Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. I will be very brief. Um, just want to say thank you to the Fire Commission of Commissioner Dempsey, our colleagues from the Boston Police and EMS for their exceptional work, professional job that they've been doing for the residents of the city. Uh, they work hard every day and every night and uh, we're so fortunate to have dedicated and professional leaders in the city at the top, but also the rank and file police, the rank and file fire and EMS as well. So, uh, Council Faraday, I have no further comments. Looking forward to hearing hearing about the testimony. Very good. Thank you, Council President. And Councilor uh, Brian Morell is on. Uh, thank you, Council Faraday, and thank you to all our um, public safety uh, departments that are here today for um, being committed uh, to our safety of our city um, and always um, providing exceptional work and professional work as Councillor uh, Flynn had said. Um, but as, as we discuss um, the execution of these federal grants to support the work of our, of our public safety agencies to do crucial work around domestic um, and sexual violence, the opioid uh, epidemic and our fire emergency response, uh, I feel like we must be clear about how we all center equity and address the continued disparities and the lack of diversity in our departments. Uh, we know that communities most in need of public safety resources often have the most mistrust with law enforcement and government agencies. Um, and they also fail to see public safety personnel that look like them or reside in their communities. And they may have language or cultural barriers that make them less likely to access the critical services these agency administer. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from my colleagues and the speakers today about how we can utilize federal funds to ensure all our communities feel safe and we eliminate any disparities in our public safety departments. Thank you. Thank you, Council Rell. And with that, uh, Commissioner uh, Dempsey, we're going to turn right over to you for those two dockets 0159. That's the 24 million and some change uh, grant, as well as docket 0163, which is year four of a four year grant. If you can maybe just dive into uh, both of those grants and then we'll turn it over for council questions, if any, and then uh, try to get uh, you back to uh, doing what you do best, which is uh, running the fire department. Okay, thank, thank you, Councillor. Uh, 
So let's start off with the SAFER grant, which is uh, for funding for 85 new firefighters. Uh, we're looking, this is the uh, largest grant in the country, by the way. Uh, it will save the uh, city uh, over $24 million over the next three years for, uh, uh, for salaries for these 85 new recruits. Uh, <clears throat> their effective date will be uh, February 25th of this year. And uh, like I said, it's for three years. Uh, don't have any much more on that uh, unless you have questions on it. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, well, just a brief on, on the safer grant. So that's from, um, is, there, is there a recruit class uh, based on the last civil service test? Are they already vetted and ready to go? Or is that, is this will be in addition to that where we'll have to now vet for 85? That's one part of my question. The other part is, uh, what if any of this, uh, these resources go to the fire alarm aspect? I know that you got a lot of dedicated professionals that answer those 911 calls um, and uh, manage um, uh, the fire scenes in, in conjunction with um, with uh, your leadership that's at the scene. So just want to make sure that um, we're not losing sight of uh, those very precious positions there where um, folks are um, on the other end of that phone and the 911 uh, dispatch and operator and how do we sort of, I guess, help um, address that. And the same will be to the fight uh, to the police department. I know that uh, they also, those 911 dispatches are overworked and understaffed as well. And some attention needs to be put uh, to the folks that take those calls. So those are my two questions, uh, Kamish. So I, I agree. I agree with you uh, completely on the fire alarm positions, but uh, they're not included in this grant. This is strictly for uh, line firefighters. And uh, <clears throat> we've been working uh, diligently over the past few months trying to get this class of 85 ready to go. They're all set ready to go uh, in, uh, in two weeks, uh, actually, yeah, two weeks from today. Uh, is that a, is that a, is that a bigger than usual size class? Uh, yeah, so our normal class runs anywhere uh, close to you know 50 to 60 recruits. Uh, budgeted from for this year, we also have a, uh, 40 more re, uh, spots open, which we're hoping to fill immediately after this. We're down roughly 130 firefighters right now, uh, give or take some, and uh, and that's through you know retirements and uh, just regular attrition. So. Uh, that, that's every year we need to keep putting more people on to, to keep up with that. So uh, this 85 will put us very close to keeping, getting back to our normal strength. Uh, okay. Staffing breakdown, if you want to hear that, we got division okay. one and division two fire suppression is uh, 1,208 uh, members. That's 73.4%. The uh, division three, which is, uh, Headquarters people, uh, that's fire prevention and uh, other, uh, you know, maintenance and whatever, uh, 291, fire alarm 55, and civilians 91 for a total of 1,645. And you're right, you're absolutely right about the fire alarm uh, positions. Uh, we we're uh, looking to put some more people on there, I believe, and uh, there are some issues with 911 that that are actually taxing uh, fire alarm operators more. So that's another issue uh, okay. another day, I guess. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Council President Flynn, any questions of uh, the Commissioner or the Deputy Commissioner? No, um, thank you, Council Flaherty. And Council Flaherty, I just want to echo what you mentioned, um, the important role fire alarm plays in our city. I see these men and women out there in the neighborhoods um, almost every day. And it's it's wonderful to see to see them, but also to talk to them. They're, they're professional, they're hardworking, they're dedicated, they love the city. So they play a critical role in, in Boston. And um, I know as a city councilor, um, and I know you you as well, Council Flaherty, you know, that we'll continue to advocate for the men and women in fire alarm, as well as the uh, men and women in fire department. Um, but fire alarm does play a critical role 
And then just finally, I've been working with Councillor um, Flaherty and have had conversations with, with the fire commissioner also. And um, I'm gonna continue to work closely with both of you and with the mayor on trying to get a fire presence down the South Boston waterfront. It is critical. We continue to build up this neighborhood uh, with residents, but we also continue to build it up with um, great businesses, headquarters, international headquarters coming in there, life sciences, but we desperately need a fire presence and we desperately need an EMS presence. And I'm making that a top priority of mine to get that done. And, um, you know, that's, we're not gonna take no for an answer on that. Um, so we, we have a lot of work to do, but I think we're making progress. So just wanna say thank you to, thank you Commissioner Dempsey for your professional work, outstanding work as the commissioner of the best department in the country. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Council President. Uh, we've also been joined by my colleague, City Council Kendra Lara. Chair recognizes uh, Councilor Brian Worrell for questions of the commissioner at this time. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Dempsey. Um, just one, one, uh, oh, two questions. Um, what, what are we doing to ensure that we are recruit, recruiting diverse applicants as we, as we use these grant funds to hire new staff? And then can you speak to the diversity of the 85 recruits? So we, follow, we have to follow civil service law on this, on the uh, hiring of these recruits. Uh, but in that we have, and I don't have the exact number of what the breakdown was, but I do know we have 10 or 11 language speaking uh, uh, recruits. So uh, and that ranges uh, in the, the top five languages spoke in the, in the city. So, uh, and they'll be spread out throughout uh, wherever they're best needed. Uh, I know that there is, a, a, I'm not sure the percentage of uh, minorities beyond that for the class, but I know it's, it's uh, relatively good uh, what we normally do. Uh, I think it's up in the 20 range somewhere, but I, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. I don't want to misquote any numbers, but sorry about that. I should have had that figure for you, but I, uh, yeah, no, yeah, no worries. And if you could just send me those numbers out, that would be great. And that's uh, my only question. Uh, so thank you. Thank you again okay. for your service. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Rell. Uh, Chair recognizes uh, City Council Kendra Lara at this time. Any questions of the Commissioner or his team? Thank you, Chair. Um, the questions that I had for Commissioner Dempsey have already been answered. Um, I am fully in support of, of passing this grant. I do remember having lots of conversations, um, particularly in regards to the amount of firefighters in the city and how uh, that number has been trending significantly down. And so um, I would be excited to kind of have future conversations around how the city can be supportive in growing that number. Um, there's been a steep decline in firehouses across the city. Uh, and I know that that has been an ongoing issues. So um, that's something that I hope we can uh, work on together in the future. But um, in regards to this grant, nothing at all. Thank you. Good. Thank you, um, Council Lara. Uh, that wraps up, Commissioner. Obviously, I'll echo uh, Council President in, in addition to uh, having some um, some uh, fire protection down on the South Boston waterfront. Uh, car fire, we had some success with car 10. Uh, car, fire is, car 5 is still on the radar in terms of um, you know making sure that uh, um, that area gets uh, sufficient protection in leadership uh, around decisions that happen, particularly at, in situations and emergency situations. Well, that's going to continue to be on my radar working with the administration and see if we can have CAR 5 restored uh, in addition to having some fire suppression uh, down along the South Boston waterfront. Thanks, Council. Yes, uh, CAR 5 is, is on the top of the list uh, and the Seaport District we're looking into as well as, well as uh, some possible uh, work out in uh, Brighton, uh, Austin, uh, with our, our SOC unit, uh, which we're losing a building out there uh, that we can lease in from Harvard. And uh, so we're looking at uh, what we can do with them. So there's a lot on the table right now. Very good. I appreciate your time and the deputy's time. And uh, just lastly, for, just to, for the for the chair and the committee, if you can just get us a breakdown, the demographic breakdown of those 85 new recruits. And I'd also be interested in to find out if any of them, uh, given veterans preference, if any of them are not residents of the city of Boston. Um, you know, that's always a concern of mine. Uh, I appreciate and respect the veterans preference. Um, 
Uh, I have a personal opinion that the veterans that are exercising veterans preference should be going back to the jurisdictions where they entered um, the service uh, as opposed to when they exited the service and uh, making sure, and I get a little parochial here, making sure that uh, the city jobs are going to, you know, city residents, the men and women that uh, grew up in the neighborhood, went to the public schools, et cetera. Unfortunately, because of uh, absolute veterans preference, we literally have veterans coming on the job that are from Mississippi, Oklahoma, Texas, et cetera, which is great, I guess, but you know, they'd probably make a better firefighter in Texas and Oklahoma and Mississippi where they know those neighborhoods, they know those streets and they can get there quickly. So um, I'm just going to selfishly opine on that is that I uh, always advocate that uh, city jobs should be for uh, city kids, the men and women that grew up in these neighborhoods that uh, uh, they went to school and, and played sports here as opposed to competing um, against uh, someone that um, Lily has just uh, has put their um uh, stake in the ground right after their military service, and then they come right on to the Boston Police or the Boston Fire, exercising their absolute veteran preference. Which um, I think there's going to be a longer stretch there. They, whether it's a five-year rule or a seven-year rule or a ten-year rule, I know we have the you know the, the three-year residency rule, which has helped, but um, it really should be um, their um, their um, residency should be based on where they entered service, and they should be getting full benefits where they entered service, not where they come out and just uh, kind of lay the hat. So it's I'm just opining about it. That's one of the problems we have as we try to diversify our departments. We're up against one civil service and two, um, the uh, absolute veterans preference. So I do believe that veterans should be given a preference, um, but I just think the preference should be where they entered service, not where they ended service. And that's just my two cents on it. So yeah, hi, again, I, I, <clears throat> yeah, I understand that. And uh, so I, can assure you that uh, everybody we hire does uh, meet the requirements of residency under civil service law at this time. Right. So. Okay. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Deputy. Great to see you both and uh, keep up the great work. Look forward to working with you and get these things turned around in the committee report and get them before our colleagues for a vote next week. Are you ready for the second? Right. Yeah, well, that, so this, yeah, the second is 0163, which is year four of four. That's the 491 uh, grant on that. So if you can just uh, appreciate, if you can just give us a brief synopsis on that, being that it's year four of four. I'm familiar with it, but I, I guess for the edification of our two newest colleagues, Council Worrell and Council Lara, um, who haven't had the benefit of um, knowing about that uh, particular grant, but uh, you have the floor, Commissioner. This is actually a very uh, good grant that we work with uh, on mul with multiple people on this, uh, multiple agencies. We work with uh, uh, Boston Public Health, Boston EMS, and Boston uh, Police Department. We're also trying to uh, have the uh, 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 T police involved in this as well. Uh, and this, this all deals with the uh, opioid crisis, and it's a great program. Uh, uh, we use all recovery coaches uh, in, in response to this, the, the knock and talk team. Uh, so once somebody has uh, an overdose uh, experience, uh, we will follow up with that uh, by uh, making a uh, knock and talk team will then arrive at the person's house or whatever and they try to counsel them. And, and they also work with the families uh, to give them support and services uh, so that everybody is serviced uh, with this uh, terrible uh, situation that they they end up in. Uh, so very good. Uh, Thank you, Commissioner. Any, any questions of uh, any of my colleagues on this particular grant here? I can I can tell I can I can add to this that uh, sure. so last year we uh, we started what we call the Delta 21 car, which we which respond because of the large volume of uh, calls in the Mass Cass area. We put a car in service with an officer and one firefighter, and they responded to opioid calls from headquarters, which was uh, the response time was uh, 176.2 seconds yeah. was the average response time. We're out the door and they're right there. Right. So, and Commissioner, Commissioner, prior to that, would that be uh, that be engine three in the south end, or would that be? And so that would um, be engine three, uh, four, engine 14, engine Dudley, 21, okay. yeah, the whole area. So what also that did was take some, uh, leave them free for uh, other responses. Gotcha. Well, it, it was very effective and we did it at prime time and, and we're hoping to continue that again this year. Uh, right. 
great program. Uh, Council President Flynn, any comments on this one? We're going to go in order of arrival. Yeah, thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Um, uh, thank you, Commissioner Dempsey. The program, I've seen the program work and I've seen the firefighters, um, you know, work with people um, dealing with substance use um, challenges and they provide exceptional support, exceptional leadership in our city on this critical issue. So this program is very important um, and it's successful. It's helping people, especially people that um, are in desperate need of help and our firefighters are there to, to, give, them, to give them support. So um, I'll, be, I'll be glad to support, proud to support this and just wanna say thank you to the fire department for the support and program, working, working with our city partners as well. Thank you, Thank you, Council President. Council Orell, any questions of the commissioner on this grant? Uh, no questions, uh, but just want to say thank you for your important work um, um, on this matter. So thank you. Thank you, Council Orell. Uh, Council Lara, any questions of the commissioner on this grant? Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I have a, a couple of questions now. I am curious about, I, I am I'm a really big proponent of reducing the amount of armed responses to people who are having either mental health crises or struggling with addiction. Uh, and so I'm incredibly uh, hopeful about this program and excited about the possibility of having um, expanding this. Do you respond um, instead or in collaboration with the Boston Police Department? Can you tell me a little bit about how that response, um, how, how you're deployed and who makes the decision to who is deployed where? So uh, I, we get our responses from fire alarm. So we'll get the call from that we have an, uh, a person down or whatever, and that's how we respond. Uh, sometimes, uh, many times the police arrive on scene as well as EMS at the same time uh, or relatively close. Uh, the team that we, they put together on this are all recovery coaches. And let me see what's the name of the, uh, the police uh, portion of this is, I'm not sure what their, what their team is called. Sorry for that. Uh, but we, we have 68 recovery coaches. They're all trained in recovery and that's, they're the ones that have, they're the only ones who we can put in these, in this car to respond. So the services go beyond what we do on the street, they also transport people to uh, to uh, uh, places for uh, uh, help, help beyond, uh, but beyond knocking. And so we'll bring them to uh, counseling places, uh, to hospitals, wherever, wherever we need to bring them to, for them to uh, further their recovery. And it's, you know, it's, it's quite an amazing, uh, program because it, it helps not only the person uh, suffering from the opioid addiction, but but their families as well, and they get counseling as well. So. Thank you, Commissioner Dempsey. And so earlier you said that it left them free to respond to other calls. Were you referring to the Boston Police Department? Uh, no, I was responding. I was uh, referring to uh, Boston Fire Companies, Engine 3, Engine 14, and Got it. And so 68 people are responding instead, and it's clearing out. It's leaving the yes. people to respond to it. So, so normally they would get the call. It would come through fire alarm to one of the firehouses, but uh, because of the uh, large volume of calls right in front of our headquarters, uh, we decided to try this out and see if it worked, and, and it, it's, it proved to be really helpful. Um, I, my last question, um, well, I have my last two questions. One, um, is this grant gonna enable you to expand beyond the 68 or how many more people do you think you'll be able to serve? And then the last question that I have is, do you, um, are you hopeful in terms of like the expansion of this program um, to evolve into a partnership with, with EMS and um, not require? Um, well, there is a partnership going on right now through this grant with Boston Public Health. Uh, in you know, EMS uh, and, and the police units that deal with uh, uh, this type of a crisis. Uh, I have put into the budget for next year to uh, staff uh, one car with an officer and a firefighter that would be full-time doing this. Uh, right now, 
the Delta 21 car is, is a seasonal thing, and, and we go by the statistics on, on when the busy times are and put them in service uh, at that time. Uh, but talking to Boston Public Health and, and uh, EMS on this, this is a problem that, that can be anywhere in the city. So we're trying to work out some kind of a program, and, and part of that would be our Delta 22 car, which would be uh, full time. Uh, resource and uh, if we see uh, an encampment or whatever or uh, springing up somewhere else uh, they can be relocated to a certain area of the city for a quicker response so we're, we're working on that and we'll see where that goes but uh, this one more year left on this grant and so we're going to continue what we did last year and, and try to expand it and, and look at it and see if we can make it better. Thank you, Commissioner Dempsey. No, no further questions, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council. That will conclude uh, uh, comments and testimony questions from Docket 0163, uh, Commissioner. So I'm um, not seeing any. Uh, Cora, if you can uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, is there any um, public testimony that's been submitted on these questions? Uh, no, there isn't. Very good. That'll conclude uh, with respect to docket 0159 and 0163. So commission deputy, you guys are excused um, for the remainder of the hearing. We're gonna dive right into the police grants and our hope is to, again, to have a committee report turned around and get this before the council for a vote next week. And I appreciate your time and attention today. Thank you, council. Thank Thanks, you. Commission. Thank you, deputy. Thank so you. Jenner, um, uh, you guys have the floor in terms of what order you'd like to, um, to take these. So I wanna be, uh, sensitive to any uh, time constraints um, uh, from um, this panel as well. So if there is a specific um, team member or a docket that you would like to address um, for us to uh, allow folks to go about their business, that's fine. If not, I can, we can just take them one at a time. Sure. Uh, I think the plan was for me to go last with uh, the BAWA grant and the Connect and Protect. So maybe Lieutenant Driscoll and Captain Kuzmiski could do the FACI grant first. That'd be great. And what, what number is that, uh, Jennifer? That you Good have. Question. <laughs> I don't have it in front of me. Yeah, there's six of them. Which one? Um, I have it. It's 0161. 0161 will be last. So, um, uh, how are you doing, Captain? You want to take take the floor? You got, I'll defer to you guys in terms of uh, which ones you want to do and in what order. So, you have the floor, Captain. Okay. I, I, I'm, I just misunderstood. So, 0161 is going to go forward now, Councilor? Is that the one that involves you, Captain? Yes, it does. Perfect. So with the one that involves you, we're going to take you first, Captain. So you have the floor. If you just introduce yourself for the record, for those that do not know you, I know you, um, and then uh, get right into the grant, and then we'll, uh, any colleagues that have any questions, we'll get right into it. Uh, sure. Um, my name is uh, Cap uh, Captain um, Captain Detective uh, Therese Kosminski. I'm the commander of the uh, Boston Police Department's D. Kennedy Family Justice Center. And... Uh, we over here at the Boston Police uh, Department's Family Justice Group, uh, it consists of detectives um, um, at the Family Justice Centers, and we um, have uh, the units of the uh, Sexual Assault Unit, the Crimes Against Children Unit, the Domestic Violence Unit, and um, the Human Trafficking Unit. And we're basically assist individuals and families affected by domestic abuse, sexual violence, or exploitation. And uh, we're here to work in partnership with several um, agencies, including the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office and several civilian organizations and partners that provide assistance to us, uh, specifically the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center. And we're gonna be using them uh, with this grant that uh, we have before you. Um, Lieutenant Detective Driscoll um, is the Lieutenant uh, commander of the sexual assault unit, and he's going to um, uh, give you a preview of this grant and what we intend to do with it. Very good. Welcome, Lieutenant. Thank you, Captain. Thanks, Captain. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Lieutenant Rich Drew. I'm the uh, commander of the sexual assault unit. Um, relative to this, uh, this $25 million grant uh, in partnership with the uh, uh, Justice Association, and it's uh, essentially for the funding of um, Saki kits, which are sexual assault kits, and a multidisciplinary team of 
both civilian and police working together to look at uh, upwards of 100 unsolved cases uh, involving sexual assault and using the um, renewed testing of, of the um, collected uh, Saki kits and using that um, in a cold case type fashion to investigate and uh, push forward any links for potential serial rapists and, and things like that. Um, also goes to training um, and really, really uh, goes towards uh, facilitating and increasing the uh, partnership with our av advocacy partners, such as um, what the captain mentioned, uh, the the and um, victim advocacy um, units and, and associations. So um, it's a three-year grant, and as soon you know, as soon as if you know, pending approval, we'll begin the process of forming a multi-group work group, multidisciplinary work group, and um, uh, approaching the. Very good. Thank you, Lieutenant. Um, any questions from my colleagues on uh, this uh, grant? Uh, docket 0161. It's a $2.5 million grant to the uh, Family Justice Center uh, for, uh, as what the captain, uh, detective, and the lieutenant had just described. Uh, Council President Flynn, any questions on this? Thank you, Council Flaherty. Just just want to say thank you to the, the Boston police. I had the opportunity to visit the Family Justice Center several times with Councillor Campbell when she was when she was here and just want to acknowledge the professional team that's that's over at the Justice Center and the work that they do. Um, myself and Council Campbell also had a city council hearing working with Northeastern University uh, Law School on domestic violence related issues and support support for um, survivors, domestic, vi domestic violence survivors. But just wanna say thank you to the Boston police for the important work that they do, professional work that they do. And um, certainly I'm, I'm gonna be supporting this. So thank you, thank you for that important update. Thank you, Council President. Council um, Kendra Lara, any uh, questions of uh, this particular docket number? Uh, yes, I think the question that I have is about the, the victim advocate and your collaboration with BARC. Um, will, in terms of hiring someone and bringing someone on, um, are those resources going to BARC directly and they will hire somebody who will be a victim advocate? Will this victim advocate be um, working with the Boston Police Department or located in the Boston Police Department offices? Um, I have some concerns around victim advocates and the track record of the Boston Police Department, but also victims' kind of reluctance to go to the police department. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering how separate will this role of the victim advocate be from the Boston Police Department and how connected will it be to the community instead? Um, I, I, I can answer that. Um, the, the victim advocate will work out of the Family Justice Center and for the uh, sexual assault unit to support victims of sexual assault. Um, whose cases uh, will be revisited for potential DNA testing. Um, and the um, Saki victim advocate will be trained by the staff of BARC to provide the victim uh, sensitive trauma-informed advocacy and support. So we are gonna work in conjunction with the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center, and they'll be heavily involved with the training and in the work of this uh, victim advocate. Is there anything being done to mitigate some of the initial the initial issues in terms of reporting? I think that it's important, you know, this grant is incredibly important. I'm I'm very much going to support it. Um, but how we yeah. use it. People being able and feeling comfortable to kind of walk into the Boston Police Department to report is gonna be dependent on how accessible and how separate from that this person is. So I'm curious. Yeah, we, we work uh, in partnership with, and, and we are victim-centered and trauma-informed approach for these victims. It's a, you know, difficult for these victims to come forward, and it's very sensitive, and we, you know, really advocate that um, approach to these victims because it is... Um, so there is so much trauma, you know, um, and we work closely with our partners here. So we want to be very, very 
um, sensitive to the, the victim's needs and, and approach it in that fashion. Thank you, Captain. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, that will conclude uh, questions on uh, docket uh, 0161. Um, either uh, Captain Detective or Lieutenant, is there another one <clears throat> that you would like to take? I think that's all there is for them. We can go next to uh, 164 with Kevin. Very good. So then, um, Captain, Detective, and Lieutenant, you guys are free to uh, kind of, again, go about um, your business doing what you guys do great. We appreciate the work you're doing over there in the Family Justice Center, adding tremendous value. Um, so keep up the great work. Look forward to working with you now and in the future. Great Thank to see you. you both. Thank you. Kevin, welcome back. Thank good you, to see you. Been a little while, so, um, and I'm sure we'll be uh, working closer together now as the new chair of Public safety. So, um, happy new year to you. And uh, if you want to take, um, uh, which one would you like to take? Uh, we can either do two or three at a time. You tell me what works best for you in your time. I'm with docket uh, 0164, which is the Capacity Enhancement Backlog Reduction Grant, also known as the CBER Grant. Perfect. That's the 272,000 uh, $272, dollar. That's the um, Capacity Enhancement Backlog Reduction. Correct. Yes. Very good. You have the floor. If you can just tell us a little background on it, and then uh, we'll go from there. Yes, sir. Uh, this is um, a grant that we received for close to two decades now. Um, it has been called other grants in the past, but um, most recently, the Capacity Enhancement Backlog Reduction Grant, also known as the SEBER Grant. We're going to use the funding to continue to fund um, the salaries of two criminalists in the lab, as well as overtime, supplies, and then our um, training, continuing education for DNA analysts, which is required uh, for our accreditation program. So this is, um, like I said, it's a formula grant. Um, we've been receiving this for close to 20 years now. Uh, we generally receive anywhere between $250,000 and $330,000 uh, each fiscal year. And those civilian positions, Kevin? Yes, in the crime lab, we are all civilian uh, scientists. None of us are sworn. Gotcha. And then, um, and then as far as the continuing education, so those civilians are required to participate in, they might have to go to what's it like Oklahoma or um, CSI school or something like, like that. those are the types of stuff we see, I guess, on TV, yeah. which um, that training, I guess, and that continuing education is what we're talking about, correct? Yes, we, we do often send people to Oklahoma, to Norman, Norman Oklahoma for the CODIS conference. Um, but generally speaking, the, the the feds do pick up that uh, the cost for that since it's related to the DNA database. Um, but that being said, we have conferences that we send uh, criminalists to, whether it's for continuing education, um, you know, to evaluate new technologies, etc. So it is required that they have eight hours of education each year. Um, this grant specifically addresses that um, with respect to uh, continuing ed for DNA analysts. Very good. Um, Chair recognizes Council Brian Worrell. Any questions of uh, Kevin at this time? Uh, oh, sorry, my uh, see Council Flynn there. Council President Flynn's back on in order of arrival. Council Flynn, any questions of Kevin? Yeah, one one quick question. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Kevin, just give me a little bit of background update on the crime lab itself. Where is it? What's the purpose? How many people work there? Um, and, and how's it going now? Yes, Counselor. Uh, the Boston Police Crime Lab is part of the forensic division. In the crime lab, there are 23 employees, which include uh, the majority of criminalists, ranging from criminalist one all the way to criminalist four, criminalist four being our supervisors. We provide services in DNA testing, uh, general crime scene investigation, as well as general evidence examination and trace evidence um, examination. Uh, all, all of the criminalists have science backgrounds, whether it be in biology, chemistry, forensic science, um, biochemistry, et cetera, uh, which is an accreditation requirement. Um, once a person completes their uh, training program, successfully completes their training program and completes their competency test, um, they are then authorized to perform testing in the various disciplines that we provide. Um, like I said, we are part of the forensic division. Um, in addition to the crime lab in the forensic division, there's the crime scene response unit, which is uh, sworn police officers. And there is the latent print unit, which is a, another group of civilians, uh, scientists within the division. And then we have the firearms analysis unit, which is a mixture of sworn and civilian um, employees 
within that that unit and that is what comprises the uh the boston police forensic division and overall it, it's going fairly well here um we're very short on space however we uh you know we're, we're providing services to the city of boston as well as providing investigative leads to the investigators um, majority being the boston police department uh, detectives and the various units and districts Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate the response and appreciate the the work that you, your team is doing there. Um, Council Flaherty, I have no no follow-up questions. Thank you, Council President. Chair recognizes Council Brian Worrell. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Kevin, for uh, joining us. Um, wanted to see if you can break down uh, in terms of you know percentage or dollar amount, how much goes towards the, the positions over time, lab to pies, and continuing education of, of the grant? I will have to get back to you with specific numbers, but generally speaking, the very large majority is the personnel costs. Um, so we receive, for this fiscal year, it would be uh, 272,000. Um, that would usually leave us with about 72,000 um, left for supplies, training, and overtime. We don't generally spend a lot of money on overtime, um, but we have, we, you know, the way the grants work, we, we create that line in case we do need to uh, devote some resources to it. But most of the time um, we're spending it on personnel, uh, assuming that the positions are filled. And in this case, both positions are filled. We're just gonna continue to support those positions with this funding. And, um, you know, with respect to the supplies, it, it generally breaks down to, you know, what we have left after the personnel costs and the, the fringe. Yeah, no further questions, but we'd love to see the breakdown. I'll send you the spreadsheet. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Council Chair. Recognizes Council Kendra Lara. Any questions of Kevin? Thank you, Chair. I have no questions. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, um, always, as always, good to see you. We have two remaining docket demos. I don't think that involves you, correct? No, so you're free to go and do what you do best, which is run the crime lab and appreciate uh, all the work that you do on behalf of our city. Thank and you. Helping solve, so, hoping so, and helping solve crimes. So thank you and have a great afternoon. Jenna, it's good to see you. I see Maria Chivas is also uh, with us. Is Maria just listening in or will she be Maria, joining us? Yeah, Maria was, Maria was mostly here as backup for the Saki grant. So, um, but she, as my boss, I love having her as moral support, but right. I think I'm going to take the next two. Awesome. So you're going to take zero docket 0162 and docket 0166, correct? That is correct. Very good. Do you want to take them both at the same, take them both together one after another, and then we'll dive into questions. Sure. That's fine with me. Um, okay. So Perfect. I'll start with 162. Uh, that is the BJA uh, Connect and Protect grant in the amount of about $500,000. Uh, this five twenty it's five to five twenty seven eight that's five twenty seven five eighty six. It's true. I was being lazy. I'm sorry. Uh, but yes, that's the one. Uh, so for this grant, this is kind of new and interesting and a more complicated one. Uh, and it, it's in regards to Section 12, which are involuntary psychiatric mm -hmm. evaluations. Yep. Uh, up until uh, July 2021, really the BPD didn't track these. So when someone, when a clinician or a doctor says someone might pose a danger to themselves or to others due to their mental health, uh, they can fill out a Section 12 where the BPD is then asked to bring this person to an emergency room to have an emergency psych evaluation where depending on what the psych, how the psych eval goes, they could be admitted for up to, I believe, three days. Um, and up until July of last year, we really didn't keep track of these. Um, and can you imagine, as you can imagine, there's, you know, there's a lot of potential for escalation. I mean, there are people who are already potentially at an elevated risk of harm to self or others at the whole point. And now you're bringing officers into the scene to begin with. Um, and so starting in July, 2021, the BPD passed a new rule where now all of these Section 12s that are received from external agencies have to be vetted through our street outreach unit. And this is a huge improvement because now before officers are just automatically going out and executing these things, the street outreach unit uh, is vetting them with the requester. They're looking into their backgrounds in terms of criminal activity. They are following up with our best partners to see what their history is like in terms of mental health uh, background. And the, the street outreach unit will come up with a plan for the best way to execute the Section 12. What is the safest way to do it? And now they're tracking them. Um, and as you can imagine, this is all very data heavy. Uh, so for the reason for this grant is that currently, basically one of the SOU officers, and there are only eight, I believe, has been having to spend a lot of his time doing the, uh, the intake for these, tracking them in a database, helping with, you know, the officers take turns doing the assessments. 
Uh, but the purpose of this grant is to get a Section 12 coordinator, which is a much needed role so that civilians can do what civilians do and the officers can do what officers do best. Uh, so what will this will be is a master's level clinician who will be housed with the street outreach unit who speaks the language of Section 12, who speaks the language of mental health, um, but they'll be housed with the, uh, the street outreach unit so they can then do that intake, enter the data, assist with the you know, assessment, uh, call the doctor and actually understand what the doctor is saying as to why the Section 12 was written and help the SOU kind of formulate a plan. Um, so this is really just a very much needed role uh, that will alleviate a lot of the burden that's currently sitting on the SOU. Um, and it also will allow for overtime for the SOU because again, they only have eight officers, section 12 come in 24 hours a day. Uh, so, you know, kind of overseeing these and being on call for them is a really important role. We're also, you know, we, we care a lot about evaluation. So we're establishing a subcontract with Dr. Melissa Morabito of UMass Lowell, uh, who will help us evaluate, you know, the difference in the, not only just the process evaluation, but what difference does it make? What are the outcomes? How is Section 12 differing when we go through this process? And we also think it's really important with all the changes that are going on with our mental health response uh, that we're going to do an educational campaign where we'll have translators and really work with kind of informing, keeping the, the public informed about this new rule, but everything else that the BPD is doing as well. Uh, we really are trying to reduce escalation, reduce our, you know, we're, we're doing our best to really only be there when we need to be there um, and to ensure that the officers are trained properly and, and really using the best tools in their tool belt and uh, maximizing our, our uh, partnership with the Boston Emergency Services team. Uh, so this grant's gonna go a long way towards helping the SOU do their job more efficiently because there's a lot on their shoulders these days. And, and then given that importance, if you don't mind, we'll, I'll, I'd like to maybe just ask a couple questions here and offer sure. my colleagues the same, just given the importance of the program. Absolutely. The, cl the clinicians, so will they be on site? Um, so obviously Section 12, it's a 24-7 process. Um, so the, I assume it's kind of like a, it's a 24-hour, so there's like four in a 24-hour span, are they doing eight hour, you know, they're doing six-hour, eight-hour shifts. How is that working? Mm -hmm. And I only say that my preference would be they were on site because I remember back when I was an assistant DA, some of the clinicians, they were not from Boston. Um, and instead of them coming in physically, throwing a shoulder into it, they'd be calling. And some instances weren't showing up. And then they'd default um, to 911. So if we're going to sort of eliminate that sort of portion of it, I really would like to see these clinicians to be in the city, uh, hand, two hands on the wheel. But if we have to track a clinician that's living out in Western Mass, or we, he's got to come in from Hyannis or out from Lowell, probably not going to work really we need clinicians that are in and around the city that can get to the scene or get to that location as quickly as possible um, as opposed to sort of dialing in and getting the person on the phone and making a diagnosis over the phone um, I can tell you we've tried that before but when I was assistant DA, it didn't work and uh, and then it just goes back to sort of the 911 system which is I think what we're trying to move away from we're trying to provide um, you know critical specialized services for um, these types of situations and calls that alleviate, um, I think, the need for uh, a police response as more of a public health response. But I cannot emphasize enough that these clinicians need to be present. Uh, they need to be close to Boston uh, based on past practice where we had clinicians that were from all over the state and they weren't driving in. Best, best, you know, best practices. Oh, man, what time is it? Eh, Saturday, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. You know what? I'm going to call it in. No, they need to get in here. And so the way we solve that is we hire, you know, competent, qualified clinicians that are from Boston or in and around the neighborhoods of Boston. They can get there quickly. So, again, just based on past experience, I'd like to know whether or not these clinicians are going to be hands on and they're going to be right in the middle of it and they're going to be answering the phone calls. They're going to get there uh, to the scene or to that location or are they going to be dialing these things in. If no, it's, it's going to be all sizzle, no steak. So what you're referring to are our co-responding clinicians, and we have currently eight out in the district plus two supervisors. Well, actually, we have more total than that, but we've recently hired eight new ones and two new supervisors. But we now have pretty much full coverage of at least one shift out in the district where we have co-responding clinicians who are in the city, in the stations, riding with officers, and going to scenes. And they are assisting with Section 12 on scene. They've you know, the BPD is now writing a lot more of our own Section 12s because the clinicians have been really great in helping us use that tool, which we've always had, but officers really weren't comfortable or familiar with it up until we started really having this partnership. So we, I completely agree with you. And we have now a whole cadre of clinicians out in the field who are there yeah. in person. They were over the phone more during when COVID was at its height, yeah. but they are, they are out there in the districts. What's interesting about this position that's grant funded is this person's going to have speak that same language, but they won't, and they will be in Boston. They will be housed in the street outreach unit's office, 
they won't be going out to the field. They're, they're almost, I want to call them administrative, but that's really like they're going to be helping with the data and the phone calls and the content, but they, you know, and they can do follow-up phone calls. Uh, but I think as far as like, but if anything, they'll probably be orchestrating those co-responders who are out in the districts to, you know, this person needs a follow-up, you should go, because they'll already have pre-existing relationships with those people yeah. as well. And so, you know, there's a lot of repeat buyers. Um, but this is a really unique role that's kind of going to span, like we'll be able to access um, you know, CJIS will be able to access best uh, medical records, assuming it's the best clinician, um, but they're going to really be able to speak that language and help us get more officers to do this work out on the field and less of them sitting at a computer all day. Um, but this, they will definitely obviously work extremely closely with our district co-responders and be a part of our, our overall program. That's great to hear, Jenna. Thank you. Yep. Chair recognizes Council Brian Worrell. Any questions of Jenna on this docket? 0162. Yeah, just one question. And um, thank you for your work. Great program. How long will someone be tracked, you know, through, through the program? Is it like, yeah. So it's not really a tracking. Pro so, you know, we, when a section 12, what we're tracking is when section 12 get received. Uh, so when, you know, what will happen as a clinician or a doctor, will fax, oftentimes fax a copy of a section 12 to the district. And in the past, the, the district would receive it in their fax machine. When they saw it, they would just kind of go out. And just, you know, they're usually only effective for 24 hours. You know, they're only active for 24 hours and they would just go out and do it, but not track it. You know, the only way to really look at that data is to do, is to hope that the officer mentioned it in their incident report narrative. So we've done narrative searches of looking for the word section 12 or SBC 12, you know, but there's no way to really track it. So what we're tracking now is the receipt of those section 12. What are they coming in? Uh, you know, we have a database now, just like when was it received? What was the response? Who was on scene? Um, in the a really important piece that was previously missing is that we'll also say, okay, person not located needs follow-up. And, and now it activates a whole system of, okay, we need to follow up with this person. Even if the section 12 is no longer active, we need to make sure this person's okay. Um, so it's really just, it's not tracking a person, it's tracking a section 12, it's a piece of paper, but it's keeping track of what happened, um, what, what was found in the assessment, um, you know, that it's, it's really about the, the paper, not the, the individual for this. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Council Well, Chair recognizes this um, Council Lyra. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Jenna, for, for that answer. And so in that process that you just described, this, this grant is meant for um, civilian domestic violence advocates, right? And it's going to be across three. This is what that's it says. The, on that's my other, sorry, that's my other docket. That's 162. That's other so this docket. is 162. Thank yep. you. That's why I was confused. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you're not tracking people, but this is for civilian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. For sure. I don't have any questions then. Thank you, Jenna. Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jenna. And if you could move now to docket 0166, that's the 125,000 one, which is the one that uh, Council Lyra just referenced. You have the floor to just tell us a little bit about that. Sure thing. Yeah, this one's pretty straightforward. We get this every year. It's so currently the BPD, I believe, has five civilian domestic violence advocates. Yeah. These are advocates who are civilians who are out in the district stations who, you know, when obviously when there are domestic violence incidents, we encounter victims or victims can just come to the station. But having someone who's not a uniformed officer who can help provide services and referrals and help with safety planning and housing, these advocates cannot speak highly enough to what the work that they do. Uh, and so this is a, a grant that has always supported one, one of our advocates, Maria Perry. She covers either a uh, Jamaica Plain, Charlestown, and East Boston. Uh, and she's bilingual and uh, she does a fantastic job. So this grant supports her. Um, but in addition, and this is a huge lifesaver for the last couple of years, it also provides overtime because again, we only have those five DV advocates. Uh, so now we can cover, you know, we can have overtime for advocates to cover other, you know, go out of their district and help uh, cover other areas. It's a much needed re uh, resource. Any questions, uh, Council Worrell? on this screen? Um, my only question is, um, are there, are the reason why we're, we're, we're saying in Jamaica Plain, East Boston and Charlestown, is there other services in Dorchester and Mattapan that, okay. Uh, yeah, if you want, so we have, let's see, we've got Maria Perry, who's the one that this grant covers in Jamaica Plain, East Boston and Charlestown. We've got another full-time DV advocate in Dorchester, another one who covers, uh, West Roxbury, Rothendale, uh, Austin, Brighton, and Hyde Park. Another one that covers Roxbury and another one that covers Mattapan. Yep. Okay. Uh, Council Lyra, any questions of Jenner at this time? Thank you, Chair. And so I am 
And I think that you've already answered this question, but I'm sharing similar concerns around barriers to reporting for victims um, and the location of the civilian domestic violent advocate. And it's from what you just shared, it sounds like they are within the department, like the stations in each of the neighborhoods. Is that correct? They are, yeah. I mean, and I, it's funny, I, I fully agree with you. Uh, obviously, when there's a domestic violence incident, there's going to be police involvement. And I think having someone who is not a police officer to help and help them through the process, that's not to say that takes the place of so many other services that would be better served by someone who's got zero affiliation with the police. And we totally get that. And we're very fortunate to have amazing partnerships with DV agencies and uh, different cultural languages throughout the city. Um, and we, we rely on those partnerships very heavily. But um, I think for the, the the necessary involvement of the police to have advocates who can help with that process just makes that necessary process go much better and, and can do a lot of services that police simply cannot. Um, so it's just a, a way in. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate it. Yep. No further questions, Chair. Very good. Thank you. I'm sorry. One, one pressing question, Jenna. The, all those books behind you, did Maria require you to read all those <laughs> books to work with her? Yes. Yes, she oh, did. Oh, my God. Thank I God. know. She's the worst. Well, I appreciate your efforts, uh, obviously, on, on these dockets um, and giving us the information that we need. Uh, and so with respect to all the dockets, so it was just brought my attention because of President's holiday. We don't meet um, next Wednesday. So I misspoke saying that we'll get them for next Wednesday. It'll have to be the Wednesday after, but uh, we'll turn around uh, favorable committee reports uh, for a council vote uh, at our next council meeting, uh, which will be a week from this coming Wednesday. So uh, with respect to uh, all the aforementioned dockets, uh, 0159, 0161, 0162, 0163, 0164, 0166, Two of those were uh, docket 0159 and 163 were BFD, and the remaining were BPD. Um, the Committee uh, on Public Safety and Criminal Justice will be adjourned. So thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Thank you very much.